DiscerningHearts.com presents The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. For over 20 years, Dr. Bunsen has been active in the area of Catholic social communications and education, including writing, editing, and teaching on a variety of topics related to church history, the papacy, the saints, and Catholic culture. He is the faculty chair at the Catholic Distance University, a senior fellow of the St. Paul Center for Biblical Theology, and the author or co-author of over 50 books, including the Encyclopedia of Catholic History and the best-selling biographies of St. Damien of Molokai and St. Kateri Tekakowitha. He also serves as a senior editor for the National Catholic Register and is a senior contributor to EWTN News. The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom, with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. Dr. Bunsen, thank you for joining me. A great privilege to be with you. A very special event has once again occurred in the life of the church. A doctor has been elevated. Yes, the the 36th doctor of the church. Uh, We're talking, of course, about St. Gregory of Narek, uh, who on February 21st, uh, uh, 2015, was given the title Doctor of the Church by Pope Francis, uh, the first person to be declared a doctor under Francis. And and Gregory is something of a major surprise. I think if uh, you and I were to put together a list of 150 candidates to become Doctor of the Church, I suspect that Gregory of Narek would not have made the list. A potential list. There are names there like St. Ignatius of Loyola. Mm-hmm or even Blessed John Newman, and a number of others in the whole history of the church. And it is interesting, Gregory of Narek. Gregory clearly fulfills uh, the requirements, traditionally, of appointment, of declaration as a doctor of the church. He, by every account, led an extraordinary holy life. He was a saint, he was a priest, he was a mystic, composer, astronomer, theologian, and poet, but he was also a saint. He was somebody who very famously uh, was described by the Armenians as a watchful angel in human form. So he fulfills that first requirement. He is a saint. The other, did he leave behind a body of writings uh, that has been of great value to the faithful? Has he made a significant, lasting contribution to the life of the church? Well, the answer to that, as you and I are going to discuss, is also yes. So Gregory meets the at least minimum requirements uh, to be named a doctor of the church, but I think there's a lot more to it. Gregory of Narek also represents so many of the themes of Pope Francis, but he's stressing not just for this generation, but every generation, as as he has for the last thousand years for the Armenian people and, and for Eastern Christianity, represents a way of healing our brokenness of sending up our cries in the state of our brokenness to God, seeking that reunion with him. So he is a figure of great spiritual power, but also of power within humility. Probably those writings, I would say, and correct me if I'm wrong, rank up there with the writings of St. Augustine. The poetry of his colloquies are just, they're breathtaking in in their beauty. They are. They are. He was a startlingly accomplished person. Uh, He was ordained a priest probably around 25, grew up in uh, a monastery at Narek. Uh, His uncle was an abbot, and he displayed a talent uh, in a host of areas. I I enumerated just a few of them uh, a couple of minutes ago. But he seemed to have a particular talent for two things. One was poetry which is why he's honored as the the first poet in Armenian history. And the other was for spiritual mystical theology. Now, you you put those together, uh, as as we have seen, for example, in John of the Cross, and you have a truly formidable figure in the history of uh, Christian mysticism. His first great book, his first great writing, was a commentary on arguably one of the most challenging books of the Old Testament, and that, of course, is the Song of Songs. He composed it for an Armenian prince, and based on that, 
earned him for himself a reputation for genuine genius. Significantly, his greatest work, the Book of Lamentations, that we'll unpack a little bit in a minute, was written at the very end of his life, probably around 1003, as he lay dying, as as he was moving toward death from some sort of a terminal disease, at least a debilitating disease, and was looking around at the deteriorating situation surrounding Armenia and recognized that he wanted to take all of the wisdom that he had acquired from the spiritual life, from his theological reflections, and especially his deep, deep study of scripture and write something that would be worthy of the generations to follow, not just for the Armenian generations, but for the entire world, for the entire church. It's why uh, when he was describing what he was trying to do with this masterpiece of the Book of Lamentations, he called it an encyclopedia of prayer for all nations. In other words, he wanted everyone to benefit from it. And, and you mentioned a name I think that is, is very apropos here, and that is Augustine. When you read through the Book of Lamentations, this collection of 95 prayers in 366 chapters of 1,100 lines, what do you see? You see this openness, this bluntness, this candor, uh, without sort of lapsing into any sort of voyeurism uh, that reminds you very much of Augustine's confessions. But then you also see uh, the depth to which Gregory was familiar with the Psalms, the imagery, and the key themes of the great wisdom literature of the Old Testament. So all of that comes together, but it has only one real purpose, and that is to help the average person who has a broken heart, a broken and contrite heart, to send the sighs, as he put it, to God as a pleasing sacrifice. In other words, helping everyone to speak with God, and I'm quoting now, from the depths of the heart. It reminds me so much of uh, the mystics that we've come to know over the centuries. And for example, I I think of a, a little Carmelite nun in Dijon Blessed Elizabeth, the Trinity, who would write about how from the depths of one's heart, the abyss of our misery encounters the abyss of his mercy. Yes. And that is what Gregory of Narek, in a real way, throughout these 95 poems or prayers that he offers us in that book of Lamentations. And that's essentially what he's helping us and guiding us to do. Yes, exactly. Every one of them begins with the same thing as he writes, speaking with God from the depths of the heart. And he grounds each of them in a plea for mercy. He recognizes that we are all in need of medicine, of strong medicine for the body and the soul. He, he, that's an image that he uses repeatedly. And of course, that too is found in, in the Psalms, in the wisdom literature. But he's also realistic about the brokenness of his own heart, the brokenness of that we all face, and the torment of daily life, the misery that we encounter, but then taking that misery and making of it an offering to God. So when he echoes the the work of the psalmists, uh, who, who write, of course, about the size of the heart, he sees those size as a gift. So he says, for example, in, in one of his prayers, that I lie here on a cot stricken by evil, sinking in a mattress of disease and torment, like the living dead, yet able to speak. What does he say? O kind son of God, have compassion upon my misery. He has frequent recourse to the images of, my soul is filled with torment. There is no cure for my body. I am tortured, he says. I groan again with the sighs of my heart. Quoting Psalms. But then he adds, treat me like a physician rather than examining me like a judge. So he's making of his suffering a conforming with Christ, standing him in the great traditions, the mystical traditions of the church, but at the same time articulating so perfectly the plea for that reunion with God 
that all of us seek and unfortunately so many of us struggle to find. In our enthusiasm to talk about it, just the beauty of his works, we did not approach those early years of his own formation. Mm-hmm. And as we have come to know these great doctors of the church, many of them are formed in that prayer because of maybe a potential suffering. Mm-hmm. And he is one who wasn't immune from that. When you look at his early life, it was the loss of a mother at a very young age yeah. that maybe helped crack that heart open for him. Uh, it does. To appreciate some of his background, he grew up in a family of immense, intense faith. I mean, it, it's uh, quite compelling to think about uh, what his family life must have been like. His father, Kosrov, was a bishop and a renowned theologian in the Armenian Apostolic Church. When Kosrov's wife died, the bishop, who had many tasks, uh, found it difficult to raise the boy and so entrusted him into the care of an uncle, the abbot of the, the great monastery of Narek on the shores of Lake Van in eastern Anatolia, uh, largely what is now Turkey. And Gregory then grew up in a monastic community in a way that reminds me very much of uh, the life and, and work of the Venerable Bede. Now, he remained in this community for the rest of his life. But rather than feeling like he had missed out on something, from the few details that we know of Gregory's life, we know that he probably suffered uh, illnesses throughout his life, his brief life. I mean, consider that he died even for that era uh, at a relatively young age in his 50s. But he lived in an atmosphere completely steeped in faith. and. Uh, in an in an atmosphere, because of the the renowned reputation for Narek Monastery historically, in a place that really cultivated and encouraged all of his talents to be put at the service of God, but focusing especially on the spiritual life. So the fact that he emerged as a kind of preeminent figure, one of the most respected of the spiritual masters at Narek Monastery, gives us a little hint of just how extraordinary uh, his spiritual life must have been. And we also have to focus on one of the key aspects of Eastern Christianity, which is the preparation and celebration central to their spiritual lives of the Divine Liturgy. So much so that the Elements of the 95 Lamentations, of the, of the, the 95 prayers of the Book of Lamentations, find their way repeatedly into the liturgy of the Armenian Church even today. So the mystical and the liturgical were two of the pillars of the life of Gregory, and both of them come together for all of us to appreciate in the, the Book of Lamentations. I could say that someone could just take two years every day and just each day read one of those prayers and it would be difficult not to have it become a transformative vehicle in one's spiritual life. I mean, they're just stunning. Uh, Yes, absolutely. And uh, just, you have 95 prayers that are so reminiscent of the Psalms, but have that deeply personal cry up to God uh, that the prayers are supposed to help us with, to communicate with God. It is uh, an entire school of prayer in this one set of 95 prayers that you will find in them uh, things in your own life, uh, your own desperate yearnings. But also, uh, and this is is the advantage I think that the Gregory had uh, over so many of those who followed, he grew up in an atmosphere that gave him the wisdom to see all of these things. So that by the end of his life, as the infirmities piled up upon him, and as, as I was saying, as he looked around the world, because Narek was uh, a, a major center of learning, so a lot of information was constantly coming to it. So they would have been acutely aware of the fact that the, the world was starting to fall apart which is a lesson for us today. He wanted to take all of that to distill it down to one 
set of teachings that anyone could take because I think he understood uh, that the generations will pass, but the human condition will always be the same, that we are going to face trials and sufferings. I wonder, and this is pure speculation, if he knew the enormity of the suffering that was going to be visited upon the Armenian people in the long centuries that followed his death, and he wanted to give to them a suitable gift, and, and I think he did, uh, so much so that the Armenians throughout the, the, the millennium following his death have clung to uh, Gregory, especially his Book of Lamentations, so much so that there is that beautiful Armenian tradition of sleeping with a copy of the book under your pillow mm -hmm. uh, to provide a kind of, uh, I don't want to say spiritual osmosis, but to be connected very intimately with this book. And I think that's one of the things that the Francis is trying to tell us too, that in the depths of our suffering, that here is someone that we can turn to in that darkness uh, to understand the deeper meaning of suffering, to appreciate uh, at its heart, in a way, this is a perfect expression of theodicy, of the fact that suffering is going to be part of your life, but God is there. God loves you. And to turn our infirmities, to turn our sufferings right up to the moment of death is the gift that we can give uh, to conform ourselves to Christ and the true path uh, through that narrow gate. There is something really special about this particular book, Speaking with God from the Depths of the Heart, these Book of Lamentations, because we have to remember that this was composed a, a thousand years after Christ, and the Church's experience of that Christocentric understanding of the Trinity and of the Father's great love for us and the Son's response it's all kind of captured in this. Does that make sense, Matthew? Yes, exactly. I mean, it, I, this certainly was not intended by Gregory, for example. This is very clear to replace the Psalms, quite the opposite. Right. It is, mm -hmm. in fact, uh, the fruit of what becomes obvious are decades of meditation, reflections on the Psalms, on Scripture, on wisdom literature. So for Gregory, uh, I don't think he, in any sense... Uh, for, because of the one word that I'm going to get to in a second, in any sense saw this as a replacement for the Psalms. Rather, he is showing us this is what can come from you. Mm -hmm. When you spend your life in prayer with the sacraments, perfecting the virtues, and above all, reading and making a truly part of your life the scriptures, the, the key word for all of these prayers Yes, we turn to God. Yes, we, we try to send up our sighs and our brokenness, but we do so in humility. And I think that's one of the things that Francis is also trying to impart to us, that what does Francis say? However many times we fall, God is willing to forgive us. Yet we grow tired of asking him. and We lose our humility so that we lose that humble and contrite heart. We have to have that humility. And Gregory teaches us that humility has to be central in how we approach this. Humility because we stand before our Creator. We must stand in awe, but also in gratitude and in justice. Give that Creator his due in praise and in worship. And so the, the Book of Lamentations really is a complete school of prayer in the sense that it teaches us humility, it helps us recognize our brokenness. But in that brokenness and in that humility, we are able to transform our suffering, our weakness, to take it away from bitterness, resentment, regret, to a kind of joy in that humility of offering ourselves to God. But we're doing it because it is just, it is being faithful in perfecting the, the virtue of justice, that we are giving God his due as our creator, and we're trusting him. And, and that's something that uh, Gregory, I think, understood very profoundly, and, and it becomes manifest when you read these 95 prayers. It's not to, to look at us as shameful creatures, but really realizing our littleness. Here we have a, another 
mystical doctor of prayer that the church lists us up, uh, who now is in the, the same lines as St. Therese and Teresa of Avila and those others who are always saying humility, 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 it, it, like the queen of humility, all modeled on Our Lady. Yes, yeah, uh, who is a very prominent figure in, in Gregory's writings. And because of this declaration of him now as a doctor of the church, the universal church is able to reappraise him in, in many ways to discover him. I mean, you and I at the, the start of our conversation here both acknowledged the fact that the vast majority of people who heard the name Gregory of Narek actually had no idea who he was. They probably in their entire lives had never heard of him. That doesn't mean that he wasn't a doctor of the church. And now we have this opportunity as a church to take his writings, this book of Lamentations, and go line by line, as you, as you suggest, prayer by prayer, and appreciate it, meditate on it, study it, and then live it in, in precisely the same way that we have been such powerful beneficiaries, such great beneficiaries of other doctors of the church, John of the Cross, Teresa of Avila, Therese of Lisieux who offered their own body of teachings uh, for the betterment of the church, but most important from their standpoint, for the betterment of our souls. The term mystic, I'm, I've, I've mentioned that a couple times here, it, it is essentially what we're all called to by nature of our baptism, isn't it? It is. Uh, when we think about other doctors of the church, uh, John of the Cross, uh, uh, with the great figures in the history of the church, Francis de Sales and, and others, what do they all tell us? That mystical union, the progress in the spiritual life, is not for a select group of people. It is for all of us. Sanctity is for all of us. Now, our paths are going to be a little different. Mm -hmm. and, and here you get into the whole discussion, especially in Eastern uh, Christianity, Eastern spirituality of cataphotic versus apophotic prayer and then all of that. But Gregory stands in that tradition of helping to remind us that we are called to holiness, that we are called to that mystical union, to heal our brokenness and find that reunion with the divine, a teaching I think that all of us need to appreciate. And, and I think one of the things that we will benefit most from, from these 95 prayers. On that uh, time when he will be declared a doctor of the church, it probably will not go without a bit of controversy, as we alluded to earlier, because it is occurring at, at the same time of a, a tragic, tragic reminiscence of the Armenian genocide, and one that Pope Francis spoke about, if I'm mistaken, the year prior, and was taken to task by the Turks, saying, how dare you? Uh, term it that way, but yet that's indeed what it was when you have, what, 1.2 to 1.5 million people killed in such a short period? Yes, yes. Uh, the Armenian genocide is a historical reality, and it has, I think, great pertinence to the, the situation in which we find ourselves now with the, the, the suffering and the plight of Eastern Christianity. Gregory offers us um, as, as we, you and I have been talking, uh, a source of understanding more about Eastern Christianity, Eastern spirituality, and in a way, the, 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 the depth to which uh, the Armenian people have been able to go spiritually uh, with Gregory uh, to survive and find consolations in the midst of this suffering. The other is precisely that, that this is an opportunity for us to revisit the catastrophe of the Armenian genocide uh, and to recognize uh, the historical reality of it, but also the historical reality of the Armenian people as a model for Christians everywhere. I would also suggest that as people begin to find these prayers and to really uh, begin to take it into their heart, they may also want to explore that beautiful, rich liturgy of the Armenian church. And I mean, there's just nothing quite like that. They're sung 
celebration. It is just so full. I don't know how else to explain it. It's the fullness of worship in, in many ways, isn't it, Matthew? Right. Well, as, as we've been talking, the, the, the central place, the, the key place of the divine liturgy and the life of, of Eastern Christianity uh, is, is something that cannot be underestimated. And to hear the Armenian liturgy is to hear elements of the work of Gregory of Narek, as, as, as we've been talking. Many of the prayers in the Book of Lamentations have found their way into the Armenian liturgy. And so we, we see, once again, that, that union of the divine liturgy with the eloquence of their spiritual writings and their prayer life. Uh, and that's something, too, that I think we're called now as a universal church to appreciate and to meditate and to celebrate. Any final thoughts on this in, incredible uh, saint as well as this moment in the life of the church? Yeah, I think that the surprise that surrounded Gregory's appointment to the position, to the rank of doctor of the church, tells us something about the diversity and the, the stunning historical life of the faith that we can even now, having studied and, and reflected on the life of the church, and we have we had 35 doctors of the church, even now we can almost literally stumble onto someone like Gregory of Narek and have placed before us a treasure and a treasury of wisdom and spiritual graces uh, tells us how much more we have to learn and reminds us how many other treasures are out there that we haven't yet discovered. It's, it's why we persevere in the faith, but it's also why we continue and can spend a lifetime studying the faith and never, never reach the bottom of this well. That's what makes it so exciting. It is. It, it, it makes it such an incredible journey. It is. And, and why it's such a joy to be a Catholic every day of your life. Amen. St. Gregory of Narek. Pray for us. Amen. Thank you, Dr. Matthew Bunsen. Great to be with you. You've been listening to The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen. To hear and or to download this program along with hundreds of other spiritual formation programs, visit discerninghearts.com. This has been a production of Discerning Hearts. I'm your host, Chris McGregor. We hope that if this has been helpful for you, that you will first pray for our mission. And if you feel us worthy, consider a charitable donation, which is fully tax deductible to support our efforts. But most of all, we pray that you will tell a friend about DiscerningHearts.com and join us next time for The Doctors of the Church, The Charism of Wisdom with Dr. Matthew Bunsen.